Well, good morning, brothers. Just a delight to be with you. Really looking forward to this time. I apologize I wasn't able to make the first session last night. Uh, I was out on the East Coast Sunday evening, and it was about the best I could do to get here for the second session. So I apologize for Harold for not uh, being here. But uh, as Mercer was speaking last night, I thought, I am just amazed how the Lord, when he was uh, sharing what he was going to be speaking on for the week, um, how it's going to dovetail into exactly what I'm speaking on. It's just amazing to me. Uh, the PPT that you're seeing is the first, you're the first ones to see it. All right. It's newly developed for this week. We're going to be looking at uh, living out God's wisdom, a sevenfold pattern of church truth. We've already seen from last night that um, God puts these patterns in place to reflect himself, to teach us of his glory. And so what I'd like to share with you this week is what are, there's probably more than seven, I'm going to focus on seven. What are the seven things, a sevenfold pattern that God wants to demonstrate through the church, the, the glories, the characteristics, the attributes of himself? And so we'll be looking at that uh, this week. And we're not flipping. Okay, thanks, Steve. All right, so in our first session together, we're going to be looking at two of the seven things. The first is Christ is the head and center of the church. We were already introduced to that topic somewhat last night. And then we're going to be looking at the unity of all believers. And Steve, you may want to move over. I'm afraid I'm going to be blocking you there. All right, so kind of a foundational verse to start with. I've tried to put most of the scriptures I'm referencing in the PPT so you can see them up front. This is Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 11. Paul writes that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now, at this present time, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the church is on display for powers and principalities to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God. Just as God used the tabernacle to teach the Israelites about heavenly things, God is using the church to teach powers and principalities about his authority, his wisdom, his character, his goodness, his attributes. So to this end, the nature and order of the church are patterned after God himself in at least seven ways. And so it's, uh, I think, at least when I was in grammar school, occasionally you would have this opportunity for show and tell. You know, the, the boys would bring frogs and snakes and the girls would bring kittens and puppies. And you, would, you got to tell about what was special to you, kind of show and tell. Well, the church is on show and tell for powers and principalities to show God's glory, to show him uh, his manifold wisdom. All right, so the first thing we'll look at here is Christ is the head and the center of the church. And there's some expressions of this, proper biblical expressions of this truth. The first of these seven, the sevenfold pattern we'll be looking at. And we'll also be looking at um, some We'll look at the expressions, and then we'll also look at how th that truth is being depressed or changed, uh, compromised uh, in today in churchianity. So Ephesians 1, 2 through 23, Colossians 1, 18, we'll look at that in just a minute. But just as a thumbnail, through weekly breaking of bread and remembrance of Christ, prayers in his name, teaching and fellowship, he endorses his truth. So let's look at some of these uh, passages. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him 
who fills all in all. The Father gave that authority to Christ, and he is the head over the church. There's just the head, and there's the body. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. We sort of looked at that verse last night. Luke 22.19, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the response of the early church after Pentecost, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, in teaching, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. John 14, 13. Now, the Lord Jesus in the upper room discourse, which is chapters 13 and 14, and then they leave the upper room at the end of 14, 15, 16, 17 happens as the Lord is leading his disciples through Jerusalem before they cross the Kidron and go up to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so it's at this time that he, three different times in John 14, 15, and 16, he instructs his disciples to ask the Father in his name. And whatever you ask the Father my name, I will give it to you. Again, that assumes they're praying in the will of the Lord. And the early church settled on a practice. Later, they were breaking bread day to day. But later they uh, settled on a practice of um, remembering the Lord and the breaking of bread once a week. That's Acts 20, verse 7. And I just want to pause to say that this, uh, this is a pattern, not a command, or this is a practice, not a command. And so when we're looking at Scripture, it's important to understand what is a command, um, what is a biblical pattern, what what for maybe just a practice, because sometimes we tend to elevate practices up to the level of commands. For example, I know people that during the pandemic, believers that didn't break bread. They said, well, if I can't gather with a local assembly, I'm not going to break bread. But actually, the command to break bread was at the night before the Lord's crucifixion. He he commanded him, do this in remembrance of me when he instituted the Lord's Supper, before the church age had even started. So that's the command. The New Testament church settled on a practice of gathering once a week on the Lord's Day to remember the Lord, and that's a safe thing to do, but it's the practice. In other words, there's nothing wrong with remembering the Lord on Tuesday versus Sunday or more than once a week. He says do it often. And so it's important that we don't elevate the practices and sometimes the patterns to the level of a direct command. But what we'll be looking at this week is where the commands are establishing a biblical pattern in which God is trying to represent himself, his glory. So I just want to make that distinction. Uh, To resolve disorder and unity in the church, Paul begins by affirming the headship of Christ. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The church at Corinth had all kinds of problems. They had their favorite preachers. They were carnal. They were divisive. Uh, They were taking each other to court. There were uh, problems at the Lord's Supper. They had wrong thinking about the resurrection of Christ. Um, The women, some of the women weren't covering themselves. There was a list, a host of problems. But where did Paul begin in trying to... to bring this church that was out of order into order. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says in verse 2, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, who with uh, saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you, peace from God our Father, the Lord, Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm to you 
to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And verse 10, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. You see where he starts? Here's a church all out of order. He doesn't start addressing issues or the problems specifically. He wants them to look up and affirm the headship of Christ over the church. Uh, the Greek word kiros is what's translated Lord here. It's the highest concentration of kiros in all of Scripture right here. And so Paul has this church out of order. He's trying to put it into order. Where does he start? Understanding that Christ is head. We are his body. We submit to the head. I like the point that Mercer made last night. You can find it in Matthew 23. Um, the Lord says, well, you call me rabbi. You call me teacher. That's right. And all you are brethren. Okay, there's, a, there's no hierarchy within the body of Christ. Now, there are roles within the body of Christ, but there is the head and there is the body. And everyone, men, women, all believers have an equal standing, but God has an order that he wants in the church to reflect his glory. So these are the kinds of passages in the, the text that are very important in understanding what he's doing. Christ is the head. And here we see him with his disciples. And this is what, this really should be kind of the advantage point we have in our own thinking. We're looking to him. Uh, he's the center of our attention. We get our direction from him. He's the head and we are the body. So when we're thinking about this pattern, it's expressed through prayers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're acknowledging his authority in the church. We come to him. He's our only mediator and intercessor in heaven. He's our high priest. We don't go to anyone else. Uh, we remember him weekly. Um, when we come to Lord's Supper, it's not story time. It's not a teaching time. We're there to as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, to proclaim the value of his death and to remember him. And remember, the Corinthians were punished because they had changed the Lord's Supper into something it wasn't. Uh, they were having a love feast, and they, they had made it carnal, and they were being punished because they, they had changed it into something that the Lord hadn't instituted. In other words, they supplanted the headship of Christ with themselves, and really a form of humanism. So, What's the distortion? Earthly head, uh, clergy, pope, pastor systems, earthly headquarters, dogma contrary to Christ, social or motivational gatherings. If we're gathering to anything else or anyone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, it's an insult to his headship. And there's a lot of things today that are causing that to happen. So the, in this first point, what is it that God's trying to reflect? Christ is the center of attention in heaven. We read in Revelation chapter 3 that Christ sits on his Father's throne right now. He's waiting to come to the earth to establish his own kingdom and throne. But right now, Revelation chapter 3, it's like verse uh, 20, 21 in that range. We find Christ sitting on his Father's home uh, throne. Christ is the center of attention to heaven. The Father is honored when we... His son is honored. That's quite different than mainstream churchianity today, where we have a man that's in the preeminence often. And I love the point that was made last night. When you go through your Bibles, how often is the majority right? And I think as we approach the, the closing of the church day age, we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 that there'll be an apostasy a falling away of sound doctrine by the professing church. As we see that day uh, coming, it's going to be the real saints that are holding on to the truth are going to become more and more of a minority. And we need to expect that. And if there's ever a time we need to grab the Bible with both hands, it's now. Because the deception is incredible. The spin on truth is incredible. The father of lies is spreading deception every direction. 
I think I mentioned this at the uh, conference in May or during the discipleship training in July, but the idea of deception is uh, both Peter and James tell us that here's the bedrock of truth and God wants us to rest on that truth. The devil cannot push us off the truth. All he can do is lure us off the truth. And the word deception is paralogizomahi, and it para means around. Logizomahi means to impute or account. It's used 11 times in Romans 4, translated acute, um, impute or account in the subject matter of justification. And so here's God's truth. And what the devil does is he puts his truth around God's truth, and he tries to lure us off the bedrock of truth, knowing that if we leave the truth, we leave God's authority. Authority is like a, a funnel, authority in, power out. And if we leave God's truth and his authority, we put ourselves under satanic authority and satanic power, and there's no blessing there. So we have to know the truth, and the, and the more mature you are in Christ, oftentimes it is so close to the truth. And uh, I don't care what news agency you're watching today, everything has a spin on it. What's the truth? You know, Pilate said that. What's truth? The only truth I know that's bedrock is what we, we have in Scripture. And so we really need to hang on to it and not be led by the masses. Um, this is a great picture. We have a gathering here of the saints surrounded I, uh, the Lord Jesus in the presence, looking at the bread, the cup, remembering the body broken and the blood shed. He is clearly the attention in this meeting, the center of attention, not a man. Okay, the second thing to look at is the unity of believers. There'll be several passages that we'll look at, and the expression is uh, identifying with biblical names, Christians, believers, saints, brethren, etc. Those are biblical names to identify ourselves. I did not grow up in a New Testament assembly. I never even knew the so-called brethren existed until I was like 21 years of age. It's like the best kept secret, you know? And I grew up in a liberal denomination. And um, this whole idea of only two distinct groups of people on the planet, saints and ain'ts, right? Children of God and children of the devil. Those are only two groups of people on the planet. And then you have those who identify as saints justified in Christ. They're called believers or Christians, uh, brothers and sisters, and so forth. That's correct terminology. But so much of the terminology that we have in the church today is a distortion, and it creates needless division. One of the main take-home points from this session is we should have the mentality of walking as far as we can with all believers. Amen? Amen. That we should have that mentality. What often happens is as soon as we disagree with somebody, we cut them off and we have no association with them. And it grieves the heart of the Lord. And so I can have um, some level of fellowship with all true believers, at least in the gospel, at least in, in the, our triune God and the, the lordship of Jesus Christ and so forth. But there are going to be some things that, okay, I can't have fellowship with you on that because we don't agree. Okay. But the idea is still encourage them as much as you can and, and have fellowship with them to the extent that you hold in common doctrine. Some of the verses, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have been made to drink into one Spirit. Ephesians 4, 3 through 4. Enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We can't make for unity. We can certainly destroy it. The Spirit of God makes for unity. And so we're instructed to keep the unity that the Spirit makes. There is one body and one Spirit. We're all baptized in the body of Christ. Um, at, at Pentecost, the, the church was created. The baptism occurred. And believers are added to the good of that as time goes on. But there's one body, one Spirit, and one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 
John 17, 21 through 23, this really ties in well with what Mercer was saying last night. Now, this is in the Lord's Prayer in John 17. Uh, just in a few hours, the Lord's going to be arrested and he'll be crucified. So this is what was on his heart. This is what was on his mind. Listen to this. He says, he's praying to the Father that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me. And I have loved them as you have loved me. So in these verses is an intimate tie between unity of the brethren, unity of the body, and a manifestation of the unity of the triune God. And so what the Lord Jesus is saying, Father, just as we are one, help them to be as one. Why? So that the world watching them as one would understand our oneness. And so the church is representing in unity the glory of God. How cool is that? We have a triune God, uh, three persons, one entity, and perfect harmony, perfect unity. And so we are manifesting that unity, a, a plural, many uh, persons in the body of Christ, one, one body, but many persons. And when we, rep- when we have this unity, we are expressing the glory of God. Very powerful verse, and it was very much on the Lord's heart. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the day, or so much more as you see the day approaching. During the pandemic, it was possible through electronics means that we could be one in spirit and continue doing the things that we were supposed to do. Um, but the heart of God is that, that we gather together, we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves, and we enjoy the local body life, which is a manifestation of the fuller body life of the church. This is the heart of God. And I think where some have not come back after the pandemic, it just shows uh, really a heart problem. The whole idea of uh, the local church body life is that there's privileges and responsibilities. We'll be talking about this later in the week. Uh, You have spiritual gifts. You have, uh, we read in Ephesians 4, a work of ministry to do in the body. Every believer is important. Well, the only way that you can get together and exhort one another daily Use your spiritual gift to edify and build up another believer and vice versa, and have this interaction is to be together. And so we read, for example, seven times in the book of 1 Corinthians when Paul says, when you come together in one place, that was the idea. That is the the best expression of, of the body life, the togetherness and unity. And so we shouldn't forsake that. If at all possible, we should um, gather together. I remember years ago, George Farber, he's a full-time worker in Iowa, tenorate speaker. He said, my father taught me that anytime you don't come to meetings of the church, he says, you're casting a vote to close the church down. What's the church? It's just the gathering of the believers. So if you don't value that enough to gather, you're just saying, well, we don't need to meet. This, this grouping, this group of saints is not important. What we're doing is important. The body life is not important. And so it is important not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So unity of all believers. We have expression with biblical names, Christians, believers, saints, brethren. Those are the, the names that should get us. But there's also a distortion, denominational names, local church membership, isolation of cliques. I believe in the doctrine of water baptism, believer's baptism, but I'm not a Baptist. And I believe in evangelical methods, but I'm not a Methodist. 
And I believe in a plural leadership, the presbyteros, but I'm not a Presbyterian. And I believe in the movement of the Holy Spirit and leading and being filled by the Holy Spirit to do ministry, but I'm not a Quaker. We don't follow men's names, Lutheran, Lutheranism, Calvinism. And by the way, in a lot of the exclusive sections of the so-called brethren, you have um, Kelly Lowe, Tunbridge Wells, Taylorites, Darbyites. That's just as wrong. I spent time with, I won't tell you where they're at, with an exclusive group in uh, Wisconsin. And they had a number of their young people um, coming to our meeting because of the, the university was nearby. Great young people, well-grounded in the world. They were involved with every aspect of body life, except they couldn't take the bread and the cup. Otherwise, they would be kicked out of the exclusive group that they were part of. And this went on for some time. Even the brothers were sharing the Lord's Supper, but they couldn't take the cup. So one time I went over to this, this meeting, set through their Sunday evening meeting, and for two hours I was grilled by 20 men on doctrine. And at the end of that, you could just see them lighting down because they had this idea, well, you know, all open brothers are, are kind of um, compromised. And we didn't find anything we disagreed on except for that, that one matter. It was incredible. We were even using the same Bibles, same uh, study Bibles. It, it was just a, a great experience. So after all this, I said, to, um, so brothers, if I read a letter next week to the Lord's Supper from my assembly saying, this brother is in good moral conduct and uh, please receive him in the name of Lord Jesus. I said, what biblical reason would you have for not receiving me? It was quiet for like 20 seconds. They could see the dilemma they were in. And finally, this older brother who's in his 80s stood up. He's with the Lord now. He stood up and he said, It just would be better if you didn't. I couldn't believe it. I didn't hear that. Sorry. He said, I, it just would be better if you didn't. So the idea is um, we understand that we're one in doctrine, but we're going to hang on to this clique. And we need the protection of, that's their, they use this terminology, and you see it in some of uh, Kelly's writings, even as late as Ironside, the ruined church. Anytime that we start adopting a terminology that's not biblical, it almost always leads to unbiblical reaction. Is that the only answer That's the only answer I got. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, we were in, you know, the, the young people kept coming to the meeting and so forth. And what happened, I'll just tell you the rest of the story, that older meeting now is dead, and the two lower generations have a, a, a vibrant, open work, and they're doing great. But it took about 10 more years for it to, to run its course. But it was heartbreaking, because I really wanted to have interaction with them, but because they thought, well, the church is ruined, we need to protect our little group and holiness, we're not going to let anybody in. It divides, divides the body of Christ. I think that kind of attitude really grieves uh, the Lord Jesus. So let's be careful. By the way, if we're gathering to school choices, we're gathering to politics, whatever, we're just as wrong. We gather for one reason, to uphold the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our head. We are all just the same, all right? There's no divisions. Can I ask a question or would you rather leave it to later? No, go, go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I actually experienced something similar to this when I first came to class with Zoom. I visited the gathering and they requested a letter of kind of recommendation from my previous place yeah. of fellowship, which by itself was all well and good. But my, my Participating in the bread and cup was conditional upon presentation of this letter. But what the question I had at the time, just to myself, I didn't make a thing about it, was they didn't know the people providing the recommendation. They were complete strangers. And upon their word, rather than mine, uh, they wanted to wait for that letter. And there I am in the midst of the process and so forth. And I, I, I honestly didn't understand that. Okay. It's an excellent question. I'm actually going to address that in a later section. We have a whole sec section on membership and reception. 
Can I say that till that of time? Course. Okay, yeah. But what you bring up is very important, but I will address it a little bit later in the week. Um, a verse that you can be looking at is in Romans 15, uh, verse 6 and 7. I think it's verse 7. He says, receive them. through These people that are coming from different uh, assemblies in their own assembly. This is just a thumbnail, short answer. Uh, the verb is imperative mood, so it's a command. And what is interesting is the word receive is in the middle voice, which means it's <coughs> good for you to receive them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's very important. So we'll talk about reception a little bit later because that it is a biblical practice, but often it's not done or it's done wrongly today. So we'll be looking at that. All right, so let's be careful what we gather to. Um, something else just popped my mind. Look over to 1 Peter chapter 5. This goes along really with the idea of Christ is ahead. The rest of us are um, all of the same. We're believers, Christians. There's no hierarchy. 1 Peter chapter 5. This is kind of a battle text for those who would argue for a clergy lady. Lady means just the people. Clergy is this clerical rule over the people. Peter says this, shepherd the flock, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. I'm just curious, uh, entrusted to you. What's some other words that you have in your translations there instead of entrusted to you? Did somebody not eat breakfast? Heritage. <laughs> Heritage, okay. Anybody else? What, verse, what word were you wondering? Okay, it's... Um, Verse 3, not being lords over those, God's heritage, not as lord, not as lording it over your possession. All right, your possession. Those allotted to your charge. Yeah, allotted to your charge. Actually, that is probably the most direct translation. Uh, this is the word uh, kleros. It's the Greek word where we get clergy from, okay? And so the point here is not being lords over those entrusted to you, allotted to you, that God has given you to take care of, but being examples. So in the context of verse 3, who is he speaking of? Who is the kleros? No. Nope. Who's the clean? No, he's speaking to the elders to do what to whom? Yeah, the flock. The sheep are the clay rods. You elders, don't be lords over those entrusted to you. That's the sheep. That's a God's allotment. So the clay rods is not even the elders, it's the people. So you can't make this argument that um, there is a clergy laity system. They, where we get the word uh, clergy from, Greek word kleros, actually means, it's it's what we get in Acts chapter 1. Remember when they were trying to replace the apostle? They cast a lot. Same word. It's an allotment. Okay? So, uh, again, that's just a, a little side uh, discussion concerning uh, there is no clergy lady system. I love this. H.A. Ironside was once asked, what denomination do you belong to? This was his answer. I am a companion of all who fear you and all those who keep your precepts. Psalm 119, verse 63. That's a great response. And that should be what governs. It's not a us and them. It's Christ and we are all of his body. Walk as far as we can with all believers. Seek that unity as much as possible. So what's being reflected? Reflecting God's glory, just as God is one and all believers are one in him. God is triune, three persons, one entity, perfect unity. As we reflect that unity on earth, 
the Lord said this in his prayer in John 17, we're reflecting the glory of God. And so when we understand this is all tied to the glory of God, and this was Mercer's point last night, it gives us that extra enthusiasm, like, yeah, I want to be a good pattern. I want to be a good expression of what the Spirit of God wants to do here in representing uh, the glory of God in heaven. So this is a little family tree. Um, again, Mercer was talking about this last night, some of all the, the divisions and so forth that have come. And the one beautiful thing about this whole timeline is there's always been a remnant of saints that have held to the truth. Amen. So you won't even find their names on there, and that's just fine. You shouldn't, actually. Um, it's They've just held to the truth. You know, Elijah thought he was the last prophet. The Lord says, hey, I've got 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. God has always had a remnant of refined people. I want to be part of that remnant. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I want to be part. I don't care what the rest of everything does. Um, there's one book called New Testament Distinctives, and the, um, the contents of the book is excellent, but I don't like the title. If we're comparing ourselves to mainline churchianity, there'll always be differences. We don't compare with other saints. We compare to the Word of God. So there shouldn't be New Testament distinctives. Certainly, they'll be distinct from what the rest of the church is going, doing, but that doesn't matter. All we want to do is just follow the Scripture. And so we need to be careful about our terminology. Um, there was an awakening out of the Episcopalian church. Church of England, uh, back in around 1830, um, and that's where the so-called Plymouth Brethren come. I don't even like the term, but oftentimes that's what uh, our roots are associated with. Again, it doesn't matter. It's best just to be believers, Christians, um, worshiping the Lord. This is the scene in heaven. Christ is on the throne. He's with his father, he is the center of attention. I love that scene in Revelation chapter 4, where we have the 24 elders representing the redeemed. They have crowns on their heads. They've been rewarded, and they're pouring out worship. Lord Jesus Christ is the center of attention. And it's so encouraging to know that, according to Ephesians 4.13, we'll all be in perfect unity in the presence of the Lord. And I think we'll all realize we had something not quite right. <laughs> He was the one who had all knowledge and imperfect understanding. And when we have our glorified bodies, we will come into that, that perfection. So this is a summary of these first two points. Christ is the head and center of the church. What's God trying to reflect? Christ is the center of tension in heaven, and the Father is honored when his Son is honored. So just as the scene is going on in heaven, the church is reflecting at that here on earth. And when we uphold the name of the Lord Jesus, and we don't take clicks, and we don't get sidetracked with all the rest of the stuff that tends to detour our attention, the Father is honored. And the second point is the unity of all believers. Just as God is one, all believers are one in Him. Just as God is always in unity, when we are in unity, we reflect the oneness of God. And in John 17, glory is uh, intimately tied with unity, oneness. Okay, so these are some of the things I think God is trying to, to teach us. And uh, we'll look at some of the other patterns through the rest of the week. Father God, we thank you for your rich blessings. We thank you, Father, for your son. Father, we just want to tell you we love him. We're so thankful for him. So thankful that we have salvation in him. So thankful that he came to the earth to bring your message. The message and messenger of one gave his life that we might have life and live in him forever and ever. Father, please help us to see the big picture. Help us to keep this heavenly scene before us, that you are a God of oneness and unity, and you're the head. And we pray, Father, that as we meet together and whatever we do here, that the Lord Jesus Christ is always the center of our attention, the head, and that we're unified about him and we don't needlessly divide the body. We want to reflect your glory in a special way. We ask this in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.